Welcome to St. Albans on the third Sunday of Easter as we celebrate uh, the, continue to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. We invite you to click on the link that we've provided to follow along in our service bulletin. We begin our service with hymn number 296. We encourage you to sing with gusto in your living room, hymn 296. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen Christ has entered into a sanctuary not made with hands, a copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Please stand at your homes. Lord, open our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We will say together, Christ our Passover, uh, the Pascha Nostrum, which includes a number of selection from Scripture. This will be said together. <coughs> Alleluia. Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive in God, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Alleluia. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. 
The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 116, verses 1 through 3 and 10 through 17. We will read it together in unison. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. The cords of death entangled me. The grip of the grave took hold of me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray you, save my life. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You may be seated for the lesson. Sorry, folks, we're having some te technical difficulties with the video uh, of William Priest reading Acts chapter 2. William, sorry. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read it. We're having some trouble playing the video. Uh, thank you for your grace and patience. Readings from Acts chapter 2. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem... Let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Please stand as we sing Gloria in Excelsis.
this portion of our service, we have our children's sermon. And you know, kids, if you're watching this, you know what I'm doing right now. I've been trying to get my cardio in while quarantining at home, stuck at the house, and you probably have had your mom or dad tell you at some point to just run laps around the house. My mom would tell me this when I was a kid and I was stuck at home and getting really antsy. I have a friend who's also a priest, and he ran 26 miles around his house, 600 laps. He was so antsy being at home, he had to keep running and running. We we find in our gospel reading, I'm going to stop walking and running right now. What we find in our gospel reading is that Jesus, after he rose from the dead, meets two disciples as they are walking. I like to imagine them kind of jogging. And it's a seven-mile walk, which is a really long way. And Jesus shows up, and he speaks to them, and he shows them that he loves them. He opens the Bible so they can understand it, and he gives them Holy Communion. And it's an incredible story. And they're so excited that they run seven miles back to where they came from. And this time, they really are running. They're so excited, so excited. And the point is... That wherever you are, walking around your house, walking in your house, running, that Jesus is there with you and that he meets you on the road and on the way. Amen. We now will have the reading of the gospel. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, the thing about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yet, that besides all this, as it's now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women in our group outstand at us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us what they had seen, a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it necessary, was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were on, going, going on. But they urged him, 
strongly saying, stay with us because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not, were not our hearts burning, bursting, burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Then they t told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you know what the Shroud of Turin is? It's this mysterious piece of large rectangular cloth with an imprint of a naked man on it with his hands crossed. And since at least the Middle Ages, many Christians have believed that this piece of cloth had the imprint of Jesus' body. It was his burial cloth used to wrap him after he was crucified. The image of the man imprinted on the cloth is said to be the image of Jesus. And you can look at photographs of the Shroud of Turin, and you can see the face of Jesus, or supposedly the face of Jesus. I offer no uh, commentary one way or the other. And in the photos, the negatives especially, it is a face that we recognize as culturally what we imagine Jesus looked like. He has long, shoulder-length hair and a beard. This shroud has been studied by many scientists. It's an object of co controversy. Is it really Jesus' image imprinted on this burial shroud, or is it just a piece of ingenious medieval art? Whether it's real or it's not, and to be clear, even the Roman Catholic Church has been agnostic about the reality of this shroud, this image of Jesus' face touches on something I think we can all understand. What would it be like to see the face of Jesus? Can you imagine what he looked like, what it felt like to be held in his gaze? What would it mean to look into the eyes of a man, yes, but also the Son of God? One of the interesting things in most of the gospel accounts of Jesus' appearance after his resurrection is that people do not recognize his face. These were people who knew Jesus well. These were his friends. Uh, in John's gospel, Jesus appears after his resurrection to Mary Magdalene, and she mistakes him for the gardener. I like to think Jesus is playing a little bit of a practical joke. I think he uh, put on some work gloves and a floppy hat just to play up the part. But she mistakes him. She doesn't recognize the Lord whom she loves. Later in Luke's gospel from what we have today, Jesus appears to the disciples, and they don't see that it's Jesus. They think he is some sort of ghost. He has to show them his scars for them to realize that it's him. And in today's reading, Jesus appears to these two disciples, to Cleopas and his friend. There's some speculation that Cleopas, based on uh, John's account of the crucifixion, that Cleopas might be uh, Jesus' uncle, and that the other unnamed disciple is a woman, is Cleopas' wife, so Jesus' aunt and uncle. Baylor scholar Philip Jenkins recently had a blog post arguing this very point. 
And it's interesting to think that not only do his loyal disciples fail to recognize him, that perhaps his own aunt and uncle, whom he would have known from a child, that when he appears to them walking on the road in Emmaus, they do not recognize his face. Our text is clear, too, that this inability to see isn't a moral failing on their part. They haven't done anything wrong. They're not stupid or foolish. It says that they were unable to. They were kept from recognizing Jesus. The hiddenness of Jesus' face is the work of God. Why? Why can't they see? Why don't they recognize Jesus? What our text is trying to tell us is the disciples have to learn to see Jesus in a new way. After his resurrection, and especially after his ascension, the disciples, that's you and I, have to learn to see Jesus, to find Jesus, to encounter the presence of Jesus in a new and different way than when he walked around on the earth. These two disciples learn that Jesus is present to them in the opening up of Scripture and in the breaking of the bread. As they're walking, filled with sadness, confused about the empty tomb, Jesus appears and he starts explaining the Scriptures to them. He shows them that the whole Bible, beginning with Genesis all the way through the prophets, tells one story, and it's the story about Jesus. It's the story of his death and resurrection. It's the story of his love and his salvation. He opens the scriptures to them and shows them that that is the story of the Bible. He teaches them that we are to interpret scripture through the lens of the crucified and the risen Lord. And when they finally reach Emmaus, this destination that they've been walking for seven miles, when they stay for the night and invite Jesus to join them, Jesus opens their eyes to his presence in the breaking of the bread. In an action that is a clear sign of the Eucharist, Jesus takes the bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, and then he gives it to them. And it is then that they recognize that it is him. Their eyes are opened, they see Jesus, and poof, he vanishes. Jesus is showing them that there is a new way to access his presence. When we gather together for Holy Communion, we commune with the resurrected Lord. In the Eucharist, our eyes are opened to the presence of Jesus that is with us. The hidden face of Jesus is revealed to us in this celebration. And that is why the Feast of Holy Communion is so dear to us, for in it we are at the table of the risen Lord. When we gather together as his body, we receive the body of Christ. And this is why the fast that we are all undergoing from the Eucharist is so difficult. But is there hope for us now? What is the good word for us today who cannot receive Holy Communion, who cannot see Jesus revealed in the breaking of the bread? Before Jesus opens their eyes to his presence in the breaking of the bread, he opens their eyes to his presence in the Holy Scriptures. He shows them that the Scriptures speak of him. And before they can see him in the breaking of the bread, they must long for him from the teaching of Scripture. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the Scriptures to us? This is what they say as they are jogging back to declare the good news to the disciples. Their hearts were filled with longing while Jesus was opening the Bible to them. We see that the Bible is there to fill us with a holy longing for Jesus' presence. 
we have been forced through circumstances beyond our control to be like those two disciples walking on the road. We can hear the scriptures. We can be with those who are close to us, but we cannot gather to break bread. We in our, are in a season of longing, with burning hearts, waiting, praying, celebrating morning prayer, a service that revolves around the reading of Scripture. We wait until we can gather again and encounter the risen Lord and the breaking of the bread. Each night before we put our daughter to bed, Jennifer or I, it's usually one or the other of us, pray with her. And then we sing, Jesus Loves Me. You know the song. I'm not going to sing it. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. In a tune that is saccharine, and in a sentiment that seems so simplistic, these lines speak something deeply true. That the story of the Bible is the story of Jesus' love. This big, complex, hard book tells that story. And I pray that as we are all unable to encounter Jesus in the breaking of the bread, that we would encounter his love in the Holy Scriptures. And meantime, meanwhile, may our hearts burn within us as we look forward to gathering again to break bread and to see our Lord. May this season of the word fill us with an ever greater longing for Jesus. Amen. We now stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page 8 in your service bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We invite you to remain standing or to kneel as we continue in prayer. The Lord be with you. you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving help from the nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. O God, whose blessed Son has made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith 
that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, you made us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you that the week to come might be spent in your favor through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and send your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you, bring the nations into your fall, pour out your spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O most mighty and merciful God, in this time of grievous sickness, we flee unto thee for succor. Deliver us, we beseech thee, from our peril. Give strength and skill to all those who minister to the sick, prosper the means made use for their cure, and grant that, perceiving how frail and uncertain our life is, we may apply our hearts into that heavenly wisdom which leadeth to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This time you are invited to add your own intercessions and thanksgivings. We pray for all those in our parish family who are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries in the coming week. We pray for all those on our parish prayer list. We pray especially for those who are suffering from the economic impacts of the pandemic, from those who are unemployed or underemployed, for those who have lost their job. We ask for your mercy, O Lord. We pray for the sick that you would bring them healing, and for those especially who care for the sick, that you would give them strength in this time. We pray for our government that it would make wise decisions for the welfare and goodness of its people. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Just so you know, uh, Aaron is uh, on vacation. That's why he's uh, not here today. I don't know what vacation looks like when you're sheltering in place, but I'm sure he is enjoying some much needed uh, rest and relaxation. As always, there's a lot going on in the life of the church. Uh, if you would like to connect with St. Albans to find out more, to receive emails, publications, to keep up to date, we encourage you to uh, send an email to St. Albans at stalbanswaco.org. It's the best way to connect with us right now. Uh, immediately following the service at 1015, we have Sunday School. Right here on Facebook Live, we have Dr. Noelle Burt Forlini from Baylor, and she is going to talk with us about the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, interesting book, books. Uh, we'll talk about that bit. Is it a book or is it two books? All sorts of things will come up in Sunday school at 10.15 a.m. If you would like to join a small group, I know that small groups are not meeting in person, but we encourage you to sign up. We've had people sign up for small groups. Our groups continue to meet virtually uh, via Zoom or uh, even just checking in with each other via email, it's a great way to stay connected with St. Albans at this time. Youth Sunday School at 11.30. Uh, check in with Stephanie Drum, our children's minister. And you are, uh, we encourage you again to like us on YouTube, to subscribe to our YouTube page so that we can get 
uh, a shorter URL. I'm sure there are other benefits associated with it, but the real big one is that our URL, that is the website name, goes from being this long to, you know, a reasonable length. So subscribe to our YouTube page. We'll have content coming out from there as well. Finally, and I almost forgot, uh, offer Tori. We continue to be so grateful for all the generous giving of our parishioners at St. Albans for the way people have continued to support the mission of the church. Uh, we ask that you continue to support the mission of St. Albans. You can do this in a variety of different ways. You can uh, give online, you can mail your pledge to the office, or you can come by the office and drop it off at our office. Nancy Bennett, our business administrator, is there uh, receiving uh, checks from people at this time. If you'd like to give online, we encourage you to go to the website, and you will see on our website a little uh, blue logo, and it's the logo, a little round circle with a figure in it. I'm not sure what he's doing, but he's saying, give to St. Albans. That's what he's doing, and that's Rebel Give, and it's a secure way for you to give to the parish to continue to support the work that we are doing here uh, to support the mission of the church. And now, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Continue with the general thanksgiving together. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness. 
to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of hope, grace, and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Please stand as we sing hymn 432.